Codex, Cadeau, Cadu, Stephania erecta, Potato plant, The Foot, Pilea peperomioides or Nasturtium imposter. There are so many different ways to refer to Codex plants which I've recently learned, caudix is the correct way to pronounce it. And there's a lot of confusion about these perplexing but fascinating plants brought into popularity by the Instagram famous Stefania erecta with its cute, chunky, potato-like body that sits partially above the soil in its pot and it sprouts these gorgeously delicate vines of semi-coin-shaped leaves that twinkle, this gorgeous bluish-greenish tint when the sun strikes just right. These plants are incredible and they are a beautiful addition to a plant collection, but they can also be incredibly frustrating to take care of if you don't understand why they are different than our usual tropical house plants. I have wanted to do an episode on this particular type of plant, the codex plant forever, and realized that the perfect guests to dive deep on this topic are longtime friends of mine and have been sitting under my nose this whole time. So welcome, plant friends. Let's start growing joy. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Plant friends, I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks and joyful weeks. If you have been enjoying our episodes recently, can I ask you to just take two minutes and leave a positive review for the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or your preferred podcast player? I know it's so annoying that all the podcasters ask you to do this, but the reviews are tremendously helpful to the show. It helps bump the show up the charts, and the higher your podcast is on podcast charts, the more your show can get in front of the eyes of even more plant parents. So if you could just take two minutes to help the show grow, I would be so thankful to you. Now, on to today's episode, the annual Plant Daddy podcast X Growing Joy slash formerly known as Bloominger Radio tradition continues as this is the third January in a row that I am joined by Stephen and Matthew from the Plant Daddy podcast for an epically plant nerdy conversation on all things codex. I love these boys. I hope you're subscribed to the Plant Daddy podcast. It's a fantastic plant nerdy podcast. You will get to know the boys and their incredible brains during this conversation. And they have so much more experience in this type of plant than I do. Uh, My first foray into the world of codex was actually this past year in 2022 with a Stefania erecta. And I'd say that I had about a medium amount of success. I figured out how to pot it up. It sprouted. It grew leaves. The leaves were gorgeous. But I stumbled with the care. I wasn't as consistent with watering as I needed to. It's currently dormant. And I'm really inspired after this episode to enjoy it once it awakens again for me and have a better grasp on how to care for it. Stephen and Matthew and I dive so deep, not only on this well-known plant, the Stefania erecta, but so many other varieties of codex plants that are way more accessible and simple to care for that you might not know about. So I hope this episode informs and inspires you about this whole world of weirdo potato plants that are just waiting for you to grow them and bring you some joy. Because I got to tell you, when when your potato sprouts, P.S. It's not an actual potato. It just looks like a potato, which is why I'm calling it that. When it sprouts and grows its first set of leaves, there's that is a joyful moment, plant friends. So without further ado, here's Stephen and Matthew. Well, welcome to Growing Joy, Plant Daddies. Thank you. Thank you. We're so happy to be here. Cool rebrand. I know your um your first appearance on Growing Joy, the newly rebranded show, but your third visit over here to my side of the podcasting world in January. We've got a standing January date together. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's usually just a good excuse for us to catch up. What the what the audience doesn't know is we've already spent the past 30 minutes like catching up and shooting the shit before we clicked record. Yeah. Yeah, we did this last week, too, for a while. Let's go. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) we're going to run out of time. (sighs) I know. It's just an excuse for us to gossip once a year. I love it. Yep. 
I'm so happy to see both of your handsome faces. These conversations are always my favorite on and offline. And I knew that you guys were the perfect guests for this topic of codex or cado. Offline, we realized I've been saying this word wrong the whole time. Your votes is that it's pronounced codex. Codex or codiciform plants. However, as we know with a lot of the other words that we've said on our own show, if you know what you're talking about, if someone can understand you, like that's all that matters, right? <laughs> right. And I will say that I was corrected at a plant store. So you know what? We're all helping each other, right? And you were corrected <laughs> to say My pronunciation. Codex. Yeah, I forget what I was saying, but they were like, oh no, codiciform and codex. So, you know, I think a lot of us do that. Oh, you were saying codiform, weren't you? That sounds right. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's so many fancy words. I've realized for those new listeners, maybe I should give you guys the chance to introduce yourselves quickly so people can associate names to voices before we dive in. I'm like, let's start talking about Kata. Oh, yeah, sure. Do you guys want to each give a brief intro to who you are and the beautiful plant daddies that you are? Sure. I'll take a stab. We haven't done this in a little bit, right? <laughs> okay. So I am Steven, um, part of Plant Daddy Podcast. I tend to be a little bit more into the succulents and carnivorous side of the uh, indoor house plant world. And we've ba- we've done a podcast for three-ish years, a little hiatus right now. Um, anything else I'm missing? You are really into like very specific plants and learning exactly how to grow like a West Coast Australian like rare species that nobody else has but collectors. Exactly. My result of your test, Maria, right, was collector, curious collector. Yes, the curious. You are a curious collector. I should have everyone introduce themselves as their plant parent personality. That's perfect. I mean, it does capture it well, I think. And also, Stephen, you guys were generous enough to have me on your show when my book launched. And I feel like although you might be a little bit more stoic, a little bit more reserved, I think you also have a very beautiful plant care, self-care sensitivity about you. Yeah, honestly, and I would think I was only half aware of it. So the book helped. And I just told someone the other day about your, your routine, Maria, where you sit with your plants for 30 minutes or whatever it is or was. That's good. I'm trying to do that now. You are. I'm so proud of you. Oh my God. You made such an impact on Steven. I know. (laughs) I I, I mean, you know, like your phone is your alarm. I wake up with it. I looked at it today. I'm just like, no, no YouTube, no Twitter. (laughs) But I did it actually. So I've actually, I've gone down the rabbit hole where I'm looking into all these different alarm clocks that have the sad lamps built in and I'm trying to optimize my bedroom right now so that my phone actually gets left outside of my bedroom because it's so, it's so addicting and tasty. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I'm honored to be a part of your planty journey. Uh, What about you, Matthew? Well, yeah, I am Matthew, uh, also a plant daddy podcast. And I get branded as more of the tropicals flowering plants person, which is largely true, but it does overlook the fact that that was largely, uh, I don't know, like a pragmatic choice based on the apartment that I was living in when we started the show, because it was just a better zone for me to grow leafy tropical plants. I've always loved flowering plants, so that's been a, uh, forgive the pun, perennial mainstay of my plant interests, (laughs) but I do I also love succulents and I love bigger plants than Steven. I'm a huge fan of having like enormous architectural plants in my home. I love all kinds of like collecting. So we're, we're both collectors. I'm a little bit of a completionist where it's like, well, if I have one Hoya, then I have to end up having like all of the similar and different ones. Um, Yeah. I'm, I'm currently uh, sort of shifting in my my plant parent, uh, I don't know, identity a bit because my husband and I bought a house uh, a, a little over a year ago and I now have my own garden and I've never had my own outdoor space that I could do with what I want, like dirt that's on the ground that I can put plants in. So the last few months while we've been on hiatus, like I have become like the outdoor plant daddy and I now know all about like conifers and ornamental grasses and things that look like grasses but are not grasses and 
I am really diving in and I'm just so excited to have that. And so therefore my houseplant collection has really suffered and I have to go through and like do a lot of maintenance. I have to compost a lot of things. I have some pest flare ups. So like I'm kind of in this transitional space right now in what my plant interests are. But I think that when you kind of give it another year for everything that I'm dealing with going through kind of managing at the moment when all that dust is settled, I think I'm going to have a much more manageable indoor plant collection than I had the whole time that we were doing Plant Daddy Podcast Weekly. And I think it's going to get a little bit back to some of my original roots of what I really love and am interested in, in terms of houseplants. Yeah. So that's, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, I definitely want to dive in more. Like, I feel like these annual episodes for listeners who have been listening to the show for the while, you guys have been repeat guests on the show. This is an excuse for us to catch up. At the end of the episode, I want to dive into more where you guys are growing because I have watched you both grow and change. We've all ebbed and flowed and changed, you know, this year. Yeah. So I definitely want to dive into more of of that because I personally know and have seen photos of your landscape and it's epic. But before we do that, we need to discuss caudex plants. You both are different. You're both massive plant nerds, super cerebral, super smart, and, you know, are known for doing these deep dives on plants. And I knew that I wanted to have you guys on for caudex plants because I feel like they are, I feel like, a plant daddy plant. They're this super specific subsect of the houseplant world that you have to have this like kind of specific knowledge about how to care for. They're kind of a separate thing. They're super kind of rare. There's interesting varieties of them. And it's not necessarily a beginner moment. And you guys, I feel like, are really good at that. And I'm not. So I was sent to Stefania Erecta. It just went dormant. But You know, that was the impetus for creating this episode. But before that, can we zoom out and talk about, I like to call them the potato plant, but like, what the hell is a caudex plant? What makes a plant a caudex plant? And why does it look like a potato in the dirt? Well, the most just kind of basic answer to that is that a caudex is just a thickened stem and it's at the base of the plant. And, you know, If this was, you know, an episode of our own, Stephen and I would like hash out how much we have to get into like the actual, you know, like anatomical botany that makes a codex because technically Mm -hmm. it's a thickened stem. Sometimes it's a thickened rootstock. But in the colloquial sense, that is what matters for those of us who are just growing these plants for fun on our windowsills, on our grow racks. A codex is just a thick base of a plant. And the reason that they have this varies, but classically, it's mainly just kind of like a structure that allows the plant to store resource and either, you know, generate lots of new growth when the season is right for it to, or in the case of fire, it allows new shoots to sprout out if the stuff above was damaged. It's a storage structure. And so if we think about, because, um, There's a lot of terms that are just kind of like grouped into, you know, bulb plants or like rhizomes. Like those are all a thickened storage unit. And so a bulb technically is like thickened leaves and a rhizome is a thickened, you know, kind of stem root amalgamation, depending on kind of how you're doing that. There's also corms, there's tubers, all of these in like kind of the the horticultural recreationalist sense, these are all codexes. And you can see codexes on plants that have a strong deciduous dormancy, like some of the Stefania, well, like the Stefania, or like some of the yam family plants that we'll get into later. Some of them actually remain evergreen, like ant plants, or some of these plants that might be dormant and deciduous when the season's wrong or if they have to because of the growing conditions. Ultimately, though, like when we're talking codex plants, it's just when you have like this knobby, thick growth at the base of a plant. This can be fleshy. This can be woody. It's just a really cool architectural structure. And there are so many plants that do this that there's no way for us to just say like codex plants belong to this family and this is where they grow. 
It's instead an adaptation that you see in so many different plant families, and you see it across the world in so many different kinds of ecosystems and growing conditions. What it largely has to do with is like when does a plant need to have stored resources or where does it serve some other kind of like biological benefit to the plant? So you call them potato plants. And I think that's great because they do just look like rocks or potatoes in a pot. Some of them look like, you know, naughty stumps. Exactly. All sorts of potatoes, I would say, right? <laughs> a diverse variety of potato looks. <laughs> right. If you want to, you could grow a sweet potato, which is in the morning glory family, Convolvaceae, I believe. That's a really diverse group. It includes like bindweed, morning glories. But the tubers that we eat that are sweet potatoes, we sometimes call them yams. But in the United States, like yams are a different thing in a different plant family. Sweet potatoes, you can grow that as a codex plant. It's a vining deciduous codex plant. And you plant. have, Matthew, right? I have. Yeah, you can grow them in bases of water. You can pot them like bonsais. There's a lot of really great, interesting plants that you might not think of that. One of my favorite plants that I consider a codex plant are cyclamen. I absolutely love cyclamen, and I have a ton of varieties of them in my garden. They're all white flowering. And because they come from a thickened corm, we're in a warm enough climate that I don't have to bury it deep under the soil in order to have it, you know, bear winter temperatures. That's basically a codex plant. So... Yeah, it's an open term. Yeah, and I wanted to touch on something you just mentioned there, Matthew. Like, there is some horticultural magic or tricks happening as well in a lot of the ones that we'll see in stores and buy. The plant in the wild won't necessarily have that caudex formed above the soil. So often, with a lot of the species that are common, like adenium and others like that, what you do is as you replant it, you actually pull up the plant a little bit, expose some of that chunky root, so, you know, that, that happens much more quickly in cultivation. You can control the shapes sometimes. So, you know, if you Google these, these plants online, you may not see or see the same codex in those pictures in the wild. Yeah, particularly if you're looking at like adenium growing in the wild versus like beautiful old plants that have been practically bonsai. So, yeah, so growers play it up, which I applaud. <laughs> Because in the wild, the actual codex uh, portion of the plant would just naturally be buried underground. You wouldn't be seeing it as much. Sometimes, yeah. 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 And for some of these plants, like there are a lot of codex plants that do grow the codex like above the soil or above wherever they're growing. Like if you happen to be seeing them, there are epiphytic uh, codex plants, for instance. Some of these, though, uh, like the adenium, like you can create the look of a codex by just raising it out of the soil, like Stephen's mentioning. So there are ways to cheat out this appearance on plants. And there are also just some plants that are just naturally going to do it. You can even take like a string of hearts, like the Serapegia woodii. And if you let it grow long enough, the tubers that it forms under the soil, I've seen photos of old plants that have large tubers that sprout their leaves and vines but you can just kind of like let that sit on the soil so that you have this like really amazing knotted shape that's completely exposed. You don't think of the, the Serapegia as a, a codex plant, but it could be if you've chosen to grow and display it that way. Yeah, it's interesting that when you bring up the bonsai aspect of it, because when you talk about curious collectors, like this could be a type of plant that you really do a deep dive of and have a shelf of really beautifully constructed exposed potatoes, as you were, Stephen, when you were saying you got to expose that potato. Yeah. And I think, you know, for so many people, right, you, you know, there are a lot, okay, I, I just said I'm sort of the succulent person. I'm sort of less the tropical person. My read often is that, okay, with tropical plants, you're going to get it. It's going to fill out. So many of those can look, you know, somewhat similar to each other. And you want that, right? Like that's what you're going for. Maybe like you want big and bushy. And, but often with these codex plants, you can get, you know, what people call like a specimen plant more quickly and easily. Something really unique, architectural. After like just a couple of years in some of these cases, it can look like really a one of a kind thing. Um, so I think, you know, that appeals to a certain set of growers. 
And it's also really cool, I think, as a design element, because if you have something that's so unique that you've kind of grown up and you've seen how it how it adapted in your care, you get to pick really beautiful pots for them to really highlight. And like Codex plants to me, you just you you have so many design options. It's very similar to bonsai in that regard, because the whole plant is an art piece. It's not just about the flowers. It's not just about the foliage. It's not just about the trailing or whatever. There's just outstanding architecture and beauty in like how these plants have grown. Because like Stephen said, they're one of a kind. We've almost overhyped it at this point. We've all right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, speaking Overhyped. Speaking of overhyped, Stephen, you brought up specimen plants. So we've established what the codex is. I think what brought the codex to popularity, especially in the houseplant world, is, you know, the Instagram famous, the sexy Stefania erecta. And I do just want to interject and say a lot of people knew about codexes before this, but that is certainly the plant that made it like a mainstay in the general houseplant world. Totally. And all of a sudden, and it was also like, I feel like it was, there was a moment where all of a sudden I was seeing all of these videos on Instagram, all of these YouTube videos of people with their Stefania erectas, the gorgeous trellises they were putting and very specimen like, right? The trellis becomes a part of it. And, you know, the growth habit of the vine and all of it just became this, this moment. And for me, at least that's really when I started doing the deep dive. And it's this you know, it, once again, it's this like little potato and I, I got one and, you know, once I got it and I was holding it and it had no roots and a little sprout and I was just like looking at it thinking, oh my God, this looks like none of my other plants. What the hell am I supposed to do that with this like furiously, you know, YouTubing? So why do you think everyone loves it so much? Like, why do you think that plant in particular became so popular? Yeah, if I were to opine here. I think we were in a round leaf moment a little bit. We were coming off Pilea peperomioides. This was another round leaf. And the called... Hoyas. Right. And, you know. But there's we... something really special about that peltate leaf shape where the petiole attaches right into the back of the center of the leaf blade, like a nasturtium or a lotus, the Pilea. Nasturtiums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So circular, right? Because there's always like degrees of that. And like we're just mentioning, this is a way to get a specimen plant relatively easily, you know, maybe. And right? affordably, I mean, yeah. Yeah, at that point. So I think that's kind of why they took off. I do think, you know, maybe some of the struggles that, that can sometimes add, right? Because there's online chatter about, oh my gosh, how do I plant this? Like you're saying, Maria, like what's up and what's down? Matthew and I both, I don't know if we struggled with it, but one of us I thought had buried ours upside down the first time. If that happened, it was you because I had a little bit of visible growth, like scars from where I could see that there was previous growth, but it's not super obvious. And like, I pay close attention to that stuff. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm particular that way, but I could really see that being a problem for people. And I don't know if they all reliably show where their growth has come out. I've, I've dealt with bulb, tuber, rhizomaceous, corn plants in my garden. It's like, I can't tell what is up. Like, what is the upside on this? Right. Circular, cool leaves, and maybe a little bit of mystery. That's, that's going to be my guess. <laughs> and a little bit of mystery. <laughs> You're right. How do you plant it, et cetera? <laughs> For me, it was a lot like with the Pilea peperomioides and various other like trend status plants that I've fallen in love with and sought out. It was the photos on Pinterest. It was the photos on Instagram. It's where a very you see, photogenic plant. Yeah, you see these beautiful like blue green powdery glaucous leaves and there's just tons of them and they trail beautifully over these like delicate little like Japanese ceramic pots like there's an aesthetic there but Stephen I hope I'm not like taking a, a moment away from you but we covered this plant early in Plant Daddy podcast because I fell in love with them. You know, Stephen, Stefania, I was like, we have to get this plant because it's like sort of like your name. So I ordered two of them and I knew what the photos looked like. And then we started growing them for an episode and there was terrible information on the internet. 
And we figured out how to be like, quote, successful with them. But for the rest of Plant Daddy podcast, we sort of used Stefania as our general stand-in example of a trend status plant that might not really be worth the hype and doesn't really perform the way that you think that it will. And it's not going to look the way that you want it to, even if you're growing it, what you think is right. Like it was not the easiest plant and it did not live up to the you know, visual expectation that I had sort of put on it, if that makes sense. What made it not live up to the hype for you? Was it the dormancy? Was it the difficulty? What What about it didn't deliver? You know, I think we both probably have takes here. For me, what I was trying to get was sort of more compact growth. I know there were really cool trellises and stuff that you were seeing online, but for me, it was such a long, viney growth and the, the leaves were kind of sparse and the leaves are sort of the star of the show for me. So I kept trying to get it to just sort of form above the plant. And I was thinking, oh, maybe if I have super high light, that will happen. There were some questions around the soil for a while too. So you really, I was a little bit worried as mine was getting going. Was I thinking, okay, do I have the right soil mix? There's no, you know, consensus online about how to plant this yet. And if I do it wrong, I could be, you know, I could have this potato sitting here for six months and then, you know, my, my shelf space is kind of precious in my house. <laughs> like, so luckily a potato in yeah. a pot doesn't take up a ton of room, but that was really something that a lot of people encountered was this potato that they're like, is it alive? Right. And you know, you can figure this stuff out, but I just think that for some reason I thought I was getting this, you know, plant that was a bit more set it and forget it. So, you know, maybe it's an expectation issue on my side too. I think that for me, it was very much what Stephen is saying. The leaves were much smaller than I was kind of anticipating. It's hard to tell scale in photos that you see on social media a lot of the time. And, you know, obviously people are staging these to look beautiful. And a photo on Instagram that has 25,000 likes, it's a beautiful plant. But... Like we, we really struggled because the initial care information that we were reading was like, you know, water when dry, use a gritty soil, protect them from bright light. They don't tolerate it. And we found that they actually want a lot more water. They don't mind a much more rich and kind of heavier substrate. They like to stay fairly moist when they're in leaf. They like bright light. Like, yeah, it, like, you know, the brightest light that we can offer indoors here is not that strong compared to a lot of the rest of the country and especially like further south. But I grew mine to best success on a south windowsill, like completely unprotected. And even then the leaves were fairly scant. It's not a twining plant. So the vine doesn't grow up and want to twist around its support. So you have to kind of like wire it on a bit. You have to kind of like manipulate it to follow the trellis. That takes a little bit of styling And I kind of like the overall like wild look of having a fairly compact shoot coming out of the bulb, the corm, the tuber, and then having those round leaves cover it. But even the best that I ever got with it, it was not pretty enough to really compete with the nicest plants that I had seen on social media. So that was my thing of like, all right, this is handsome, but like not nearly as good as what I thought it would be. And I would rather grow nasturtiums for this if I want this look. Like, I'll just put nasturtium seeds in my garden and forget about them. Well, I would not go that far. (laughs) But I (laughs) Stephen wouldn't. (laughs) Yeah, I I would say, like, if you know that stuff, you know, we've just said, and you sound up or, or you feel up for that, then I would still go for it. You know, I wouldn't maybe, like, import them like we did then and, you know, do all of that. But if you see one around, um, I think they're still worthwhile, you know, if you know all of that going in. I'll also say that as much as people, you know, still love these plants, like by all means, I agree with Stephen, like collect them if you want them, just, you know, mediate your expectations and prepare to work a little harder than you thought that you might have to. But there are so many more like complicated care tips for these plants. Now, one of our local specialty shops that really focuses on rare plants had them like, like a bucket of these bulbs. And they had really detailed care information about keeping them warm from the bottom, about covering the bulb in the pot while it was, you know, waking up to sprout, keeping the humidity high. There were a lot of very like kind of precious details that I don't know. I'm just, I'm going to put it out there that maybe 
those are things that have worked for some people, but it's more like coincidence or happen or like it happens to work, but you don't need to go to that. We both found that bottom heat worked. So putting them in an area where the soil itself is warm helps a lot and giving them strong light helps a lot. I don't think that you really need to overthink these really like elaborate care things. They're forgiving. Like if they grow up a bit and then they kind of don't do their thing, you can literally prune that vine off and start over. Like just. And it'll keep growing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm beyond excited to introduce you to a company that makes one of my favorite inventions, the Barabee Weighted Blanket. If you haven't heard about weighted blankets before, I am about to change your life. They are exactly what they sound like. They're blankets that are weighted. They have weights in them. They're they're heavy, and they create this hug-like sensation that helps improve sleep, ease anxiety, and relieve stress through the therapeutic power of deep touch pressure, DTP, which has been studied and proven. And Barabee is making the most beautifully designed, hand-knit, sustainably made weighted blankets on the market. So I've used a weighted blanket for years now before I found out about Barabee. It's really ugly, but it does the trick. It was 20 pounds. And I benefited so much from the effects of the weighted blanket, the calming effects. I literally lugged a 20-pound weighted blanket across the country with me in 2019 when I toured with Cats the Musical. Because the positive effects of sleeping under that blanket, especially while I was traveling, were so good. So I don't think I can endorse a product more than say I've literally been using a weighted blanket every night to sleep for the last like three or four years. But my old blanket was really ugly and it was hot. There had there was no ventilation. So I was sweating. I sweat under it. Barabee, my new favorite friend has completely changed the weighted blanket game by taking a design focused approach to bringing the medically beneficial products into people's lives, creating products that you'll be proud to display in your home. They look so beautiful draped over your bed. Barabee offers a variety of products that come in different sizes and weights, including their original cotton napper, their tree napper, which is cooling. That's the one that I have because I run hot at night. Their velvet napper, which is made of ocean-bound plastic bottles. The hug it, a sensory knot pillow. And the cuddler, which is a body pillow. So there's a product for everyone. So I've upgraded my old gross weighted blanket to their tree napper, and I cannot believe the difference that this new Barbie blanket makes. Number one, it's gorgeous. I love the look of that chunky knit style. It looks so beautiful in our bedroom, but also because it's chunky knit and it has holes, it aerates. It there, it, it is truly cooling. And Billy's biggest complaint is that I'm so sweaty under my weighted blanket, and this has completely solved that issue. So plan, friends, treat yourself to the gift of a weighted blanket during the cozy winter months. You will not be disappointed. Use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout at barabee.com for free, faster shipping. So head to barabee.com, choose the blanket for you, and then use code GROWINGJOY at checkout for free, faster shipping. Thank you, thank you, Territorial Seed, for sponsoring today's episode. Okay, flower mamas, flower papas out there, if you haven't tried growing your own flowers this year, you have to try it with Territorial Seed Company in your 2023 garden. Plant friends, I implore you, grow flowers. Growing flowers in my 2022 garden was truly the highlight of my entire garden. And Territorial Seed has a greatly expanded flower selection this year. So whatever your flower preference is, they likely have something for you. So in addition to my endorsement, here are some other reasons why you might want to try growing flowers in your garden. They attract pollinators. Obviously, pollinators are very important for the world, for the ecosystem. But also, if you're growing edible food, fruiting plants especially, they need to be pollinated in order to grow juicy. Those tomatoes need to be pollinated. So you need pollinators in your garden, grow flowers to attract them. Boom. If you're looking for more edible plants, there are flowers like violas and nasturtiums, which are edible. I grew beautiful variegated nasturtiums last year, and I'd put them in my spring salad, their leaves and their flowers. And violas, their flowers are edible, and I would make stir fries and then put the viola flowers in them for my husband, and I'd say that I made him a garden for dinner, complete with the flowers. It was super cute. And you can use flowers for different reasons. You can have them as a statement piece in your garden, or you can just use them to, you know, have a subtle touch in your garden bed borders. 
you can be color specific. You can kind of design them based on your mood. The world is your oyster when it comes to flowers. Plus, my favorite reason for growing flowers is that you have bouquets available at your fingertips. This summer, I grew flowers and I gifted all of my friends, anytime I went to see someone, a small bouquet of herbs and the beautiful zinnias and snapdragons and dahlias that I was growing. And there's just no better feeling than gifting a friend flowers that you grew from seed or seedling in your garden. When it comes to growing, here are some tips. Generally, you sow flowers outdoors when the soil temperature has raised to at least 55 degrees Fahrenheit. You can start some varieties like echinacea, snapdragon, or violas indoors, but if you want to skip the seed starting altogether, Territorial Seed Company offers six packs of flower transplants for you to just stick directly into your garden or containers so easy. So get 10% off the flowers of your choice and become a flower mama like me, be a flower papa, go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy for a 10% discount on all territorial seed items. Once again, that's territorialseed.com slash growing joy for 10% off all the flowers you want to grow in your garden. I think it sounds like if we go f- with, if we're going along the line of the plant parent personalities, you know, a mindful plant parent, maybe someone that really wants to like be up in their plants business all the time, this could be a great option for because it is, it's, a, it sounds like it's a much more high maintenance plant. So, two things for me in my experience with the Erecta three things. Number one, when that potato showed its first sign of growth, it, was incredible. Like the weight, when you have a plant that really experiences that dormancy and it wakes up for you and it starts growing, that is a very fun couple of weeks in your household. So I really enjoyed that, right? Like I loved, because I don't have a lot of houseplants that experience that leaf loss. So for me, it was really interesting. But, you know, the leaf, uh, it's it's gone to sleep for the winter And now I do have a potato in a pot amidst all of my beautiful tropical foliage. And like, does it bother me? No. But from an aesthetic point of view, like, how does it look? I don't know. And when you talk about light, I found that mine did its best when it was under a grow light. So under like really optimum light, uh, which I thought was really interesting. So I think we're giving this information because I think a lot of times you see these plants on Instagram, you immediately get it. And then like all three of us experienced, you're like, wait, holy shit, what did I just commit myself to? So, you know, if this calls to you, go for it. But the next question I have for you is, say I want the codic style, but maybe I don't want that much of a high maintenance plant. Are there other types of the Stefania genus that maybe are easier to care for slash other genus in general, other species in general? So I would say within Stefania, another one that I really love is Kawasaki. Kawasaki is probably how that is pronounced. It used to be called Stefania Nova. In my mind, care is pretty similar, but it doesn't make the same sort of vining and, you know, hanging and creeping sort of growth habit. It's a lot more compact. You'll get one or two or three super showy leaves They're really blue. They're so beautiful. Right. And I think when I was, you know, wanting Stefania erecta, I was actually wanting something a little bit more like this one, Kawasaki. So I would, I would throw that one in, you know, at least within Stefania, the genus. Otherwise, there are tons of great options. Ant plants is one that we were going to mention that form a big codex. Ant plants also having a moment. I'm seeing more of the ant plant lately, even just in garden centers, you know? And that's something that I want to talk about a little bit later, but I love ant plants. Like that's, that's something that we're going to come back to because... Yes, you do love ant plants. <laughs> yeah, that one surprised me actually, Matthew, because I'm like, oh, you know what? This is such a me one. I don't really know if Matthew would like, you know, ant houses as a plant, but... Oh, I would great. love to have a formicarium. Like that would be so cool. <laughs> so... Dioscoria is another one. Those are often called like elephant plants. And these ones that, you know, you've probably seen them around if you've looked at different codex, you know, things before, been to like a succulent shop or something like that. And I feel like they're kind of always there. They're never super common. They can be huge and have these really like kind of geometrical, like jagged kind of big, big codexes that they form. They kind of remind me of like a tortoise shell, like a really old tortoise that has, you know, kind of ridges on its, on its 
plates. Yeah. And really there's so many other codex options. The other one I'll just toss in is one called Bigfoot plant. This is one that again, it's like, you can kind of always find it online. It's never super common, but it grows really quickly. It's been a lot more forgiving care wise. So I think if you want to try like the big codex experience, one that's going to kind of grow quickly for you, it's going to shoot up leaves and then it will go to, you know, it'll uh, go deciduous and then it will come back. Um, Bigfoot plant. I can get the genus name. I think it's Girardanthus, but Bigfoot plant. We'll put them all in the show notes. Right. That's another good option. I want to dive into like general codex care with you guys. But when we were talking offline, I remember you talking about like a really negative aspect of Stefania erecta that I didn't know that much about, but apparently there's a lot of illegal harvesting going on. So if you are going to buy a Stefania erecta, what do you need to know in terms of who you're buying from and the legalities of that? Right. This was a tough one. So we made our episode really early into our podcast. I would, I want to say maybe a year later, um, someone brought this to our attention and thank that person. In Europe, there was a study that I think some plant retailers kind of funded and started just to make sure that these Stefania plants that were coming from, I think mostly Southeast Asia, were being, you know, sustainably harvested or like what the story was, because so many were coming at once, right? Like it was such a fad everywhere. And what they found was that really probably many or most Stefania plants that you can buy, especially big ones, are probably wild harvested and wild collected. So that is sticky, right? And this article goes on to say that Stefania erecta is, you know, it's almost a weed in some places. So it's not necessarily, you know, vulnerable or, uh, you know, endangered or something that would really, you know, you know, should scare us as, you know, plant enthusiasts. But I do want to jump in and just mention that the passenger pigeon used to be like, I don't know if it was the most numerous vertebrate on the planet or just the most numerous bird on the planet or North America, like whatever that statistic was, there were so many passenger pigeons a couple decades before they went extinct that no one thought that they could ever devastate the wild populations of them. And here we are in a world that hasn't had passenger pigeons for decades. Yeah, I mean, exactly right. So that should not just make, you know, in my mind anyway, that does not make this like, okay, forever. Um, I would just urge you if you're buying it, ask your plant seller, you know, where it's from, you know, try to inquire. Uh, I think it's been common enough over here that we should have people cultivating them here now, or we should at some point. Um, Part of the study said that the codex does take a long time to form, right? So they may look smaller and you may, you know, maybe they don't know how to grow them quickly, you know, yet, things like that, because it's kind of a newer plant um, to collecting. The other species, like the one I mentioned, um, Kawasikii, that one, I guess, is more rare in the wild. So honestly, if I were buying one again, I would probably look locally. Um, I don't know if I would order like we did, Matthew, because we didn't, you know, we didn't know this before and just to fully own that. Yeah. But I'd also be worried about buying them locally because if they're importing them, you could still be contributing to this. So like ask your local seller, where did you source these? Yeah. You have to inquire, but I would just really try to do your research with this uh, genus. Yeah, definitely. One of the reasons that it is like kind of questionable to own some of these plants in some ways is because the codex doesn't really form if you grow some of these plants from cuttings. Like a lot of these plants can be propagated through tissue, but if you take a cutting, get it to root viably, I'm honestly not sure if this is something that they do with Stefania, but just in in general for codex plants, the codex is a mechanism of the plant's development that happens when it is grown from seed. So there are many times that you can't vegetatively propagate a caudiciform plant in order to have it show a proper caudex. Like the reason that you're growing it, you can't just fake it for some of these things. So if you're looking to get like a really mature Kawasikii that has like the size and the shape of the codex that it can support more than one or two leaves for its active growing season. You're probably buying a plant that is quite old and that has been harvested from the wild because 
I don't want to contradict what Steven said, but I don't know if we are at a point yet where yeah, I, I don't know either. Yeah. Like local, you know, to whatever area you're, you're in. I don't know if there are growers who have been growing these from seed and developing the codexes that are the size that we're seeing for sale and having like domestically produced seed grown plants. So I also don't know how you can really verify like, yeah, like it's, it's just sticky and it's worth looking into. And I personally think that for a lot of these codex plants, there are some really great ones that are very easy and fairly quick to grow from seed, which means that there are codex choices that are very popular, very available, not very expensive in the houseplant market that you're almost going to be able to guarantee has not had any like devastating ecological poaching impact, basically. Yeah, something I want to explore on the podcast this year, and listeners, if you are interested in this, please DM me and let me know. But I spoke at a really large horticulture conference, industry conference a couple of years ago, and I was shocked at how little we as the consumer understand about the grower to seller to plant shop experience. Like the horticulture industry is this huge industry that we don't really know that much about. And I really want to kind of explore how growers conduct their business, how how you grow a plant, how you get a codex seed, how do, how do you secure one, how you grow it, then who the distributors that it's going to. Like, I just think that's also fascinating. But anyway, we're here to talk about codex plants. Yeah, so That's an episode for later. <laughs> so care. What do we need to know in terms of general care for if we're taking home a codex, whether it's one of the Stefanias or another codex, are there some kind of high level things that you need to know for these types of plants that are going to differ from our normal tropical house plants? Yeah. And I think that this is, this is a really simple kind of plant. Like we're, we're talking about the challenges of growing them, but I want to just throw out that if we're talking about these as being quote, high maintenance plants, it's not because their care needs are super exacting. It's just because they have like specific little attributes that have to be observed. They have growth cycles that do things at different times of year. So in a very broad general sense, just research the individual plant that you have because the care will vary quite a bit between them. But with all of that said, the general parameters are that they often like well-draining soil. They want to have pretty good amounts of light. Like I haven't had any codex plant that hasn't tolerated at least a few hours of direct sunlight on a windowsill or ones that would prefer to have all day full sun, you know, perhaps outside under grow lights, whatever. They all want good light. A lot of these plants either are adapted for ecosystems where they have to conserve moisture because it's more of a desert arid environment, which means that they're going to get high strong light or they come from areas that have, you know, high monsoon season rains and low uh, dry season moisture availability. And then when they're ready to grow, they'll shoot out scrambling vines that go and they try to reach as much light as they can to store up more resource for that codex to grow larger, to produce fruit, flowers, everything that it needs for coming seasons. So don't underdo the light for these. Some of them might burn if you put them, you know, directly into full direct completely like unforgiving Texas or Southern California or Arizona sun. But in a general sense, these are fairly high light plants and they're going to look their best and grow their best and stay the most compact with good, strong light. Many of them want good amounts of water while they're in active growth because this adaptation, they put on foliage, they put on whatever else they're going to do above ground during seasons where they have the resources. So if you've got like a climbing onion and it's putting out foliage, water it pretty heavily. You want that soil to barely dry out between waterings. You almost never find a codex plant that wants to sit in water or have really super heavy, unbreathable substrates. But in many cases, like just a general potting soil is going to work. For some of them, you are going to want to incorporate some perlite, some pumice, coarse sand, grit. But a lot of them actually want a fair amount of nutrient-rich compost so that you can kind of 
you know, get the most bang for your buck in that active growing season. So research the individual plant for sure, because there are exceptions to this. But when the plant's in active growth, give it good light, give it as much water as it wants. If you start to notice foliage, you know, withering or dying back, if portions of the plant are dying back when you think it should be actively growing, that's your sign that you're triggering a dormancy and should be watering it more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like... I agree with all that, Matthew, to paint with the broadest brush. It's like start with how you care for succulents in your house and then just make sure there's plenty of water when it's in active growth. Love this all. Okay, two questions. When watering, I remember when I was first potting up my Stefania erecta, I was like, do I only water the soil around the caudex? Or am I putting the water on top of the caudex and I'm letting the water stream over the bulb and then go into the soil? What are your practices? All right. So me first. Yeah. I just water around because I'm thinking of it as like a succulent sort of, right? So I'm like, oh, you know what? I don't want there to be water in little nooks and crannies here. No, no. I water around it. And I don't think I ever let it touch the caudex itself if I can help it. But I, I now wasn't told I do to the do that. opposite, Stephen. <laughs> really? That doesn't surprise me because, like, you and I are similar. <laughs> are you doing? Do you do that too? <laughs> well, it, I I usually use like a little like squeeze bottle, you know, like the kinds of like s- yes, soft plastic the water ones. bottles. Yeah, restaurant uh-huh. or I think of them as like tattoo shop or like laboratory bottles. But I love those for like watering my smaller plants because I can target exactly where that water goes. And so I water around the outside of the pot. If I've let it dry a lot, we're all familiar, like super dry soil kind of like shrinks, pulls away from the side of the pot. So if you water around the edge, like that water is just draining through to the saucer, it's not really soaking in a lot. So if I have a plant that is drying a lot between waterings, I do squirt that water like around the codex, I'll get the whole codex wet because in my mind, it's like these plants are, you know, from Thailand or, you know, wherever. Like, I'm sure they're going to get rained on. Yeah, I don't. (laughs) But like that way, I know that the water is running around the outside of the codex and then it's soaking in like right around the base of it. If I was really worried about some particular codex plant rotting, I would probably not do this or I would plant it slightly higher above the soil than it wants. And then I'd put like a medium fine gravel top dressing just on the top of the pot so that it's elevated off of the the soil substrate so that as I am watering, the caudex itself is not sitting against something that's wet, but it's like supported by the gravel. It gives a good drainage zone. That's like a really precious thing that I do sometimes that it's hard to then tell what the soil moisture level is if it's covered in gravel. But like there's there's ways around this and I actually don't think I don't think that it matters too much. If you get your codex wet, don't worry. If your codex is one that's like really craggy and if you're growing it in a high humidity, low airflow environment and it's never going to dry and there's water collecting in cracks and crevices, yeah, that's going to invite rot. But like how many people have that condition in their home for their plants? There are some codex plants that I know that kind of grow like a kind of like a jelly donut kind of style codex or like a like a red blood cell where it's a little indented in the center. It's not classically a codex. Yeah, like there's some codiciform begonias and like tuberous begonias that aren't really codex plants, but they will have that indentation in the center so that if there's water that will collect and that can cause rot of new growth as it comes out. But, you know, just just take that into account as you're watering. You don't want water to collect in the codex. See, this is fascinating to me. And I love panels like this because we literally all have different experiences. Steven doesn't for the most part. Matthew is still a little controlled about it. I started so precious with my Stefania erecta. I only watered the little strip of soil. I was like, so, but I'm a pretty chaotic waterer. I don't have those fancy bottles that I, that I know exactly what you're talking about. I have a, I have a watering can with a skinny spout, but there were a couple of days where I was watering just chaotically. And I, I like, 
I set my plants up. They're all on trays. The Whatever they're sitting on is not going to get wet because I know that I'm going to get water on whatever they're sitting on all the time. And so there was one day where I was just like, but also everyone's environment is different. It's 30% humidity in my house. I do not grow my Stefania under a dome or with a humidifier. Like my Stefania has adjusted to my house. Yeah, as and, it um, should. It's a house plant. Right. So one day I was like, this would be kind of fun if I like made it rain all over this plant and like had a waterfall moment and nothing happened. So now I water as like chaotically as all my other plants and it doesn't, I mean, it, it grew, it grew until it didn't. But um, I think that's very interesting. I would not overthink it. And I think I love that. And I think when, when you're thinking about rot, because this plant that has this large mass is set up for rot, it's more about knowing the actual caudex, if there are those holes where water is going to collect inside of it, or it's more about the substrate because if this caught, that's what I stressed about was I was like, I have this potato sitting on this moist soil. How is the bottom not going to rot? But also I got my caudex with no roots. And so I was like, how are roots growing on this thing? And I knew that water and, you know, the change in having the humidity and having the water is probably what also triggers the roots to start to grow. So it's all interesting to me. So that's a really good thing to mention about, like, where do the roots grow? How do they come out? They obviously need to have the presence of moisture to tell them to grow roots. But my first go of growing my Stefania, we also tend to grow these in fairly small pots. So side note, Buy some of those little squeeze bottles, Maria. Like it is going to be. I'm going to so, buy some. Yeah, like they're they're, <laughs> they're they're cheap. You can get a six pack of them. But yeah. like when you're growing plants in a fairly small pot because they want to have like you know confined roots, you don't want the codex to be like you know two inches in the center of a ten inch pot. When you're using a watering can, even with a narrow spout, it's hard to get the soil wet. So get that little squeeze bottle. It's very easy, and you can do it regularly. So that it like drains through, it's good. But I had to adjust my soil recipes because I hear these are succulents. They want to dry a bit between waterings. So I use greedy coarse mixes. I am a lazy waterer. I have had up to 400 plants at a time. I have far less than that right now. But it's hard and to keep... you moved enough times that I trust that, that census. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's hard for me personally to water often enough to keep them in good growth with a really gritty substrate. So my climbing onion, my Boia volubilis, and my Stefania, both Kawasakii and the... Nice work. You landed both of those pronunciations. That was, yeah, that was a I... fantastic <laughs> pronunciation. Thanks. <laughs> and also the Erecta. Wow. Um, I'd like some tongue <laughs> exercises or something. <laughs> Tongue exercises? Uh, <laughs> you know what? Boia volubilis, okay? I'm going to have you say that, okay, Maria, in about five minutes, random. Yeah. Boia volubilis. <laughs> See what happens. Boia volubilis. <laughs> it's a fun little word, okay, and sorry. I love the way that Summer Rain Oak says it, too. She, like, really punches the word. Um, but I started transitioning to more moisture-retaining typical like foliage plant generic potting soil because I knew that they would dry enough and their roots would be healthy enough with my watering habits. So like make sure that they have enough moisture retention or else they're going to be slammed into dormancy more often, less consistently. Like it's, it's not great. Okay. I was just going to say regarding dormancy, just to put this out there, I have not had a dormant Stefania in a couple of years. They're growing really? really well. Oh, tell me more. Yeah. So I just, but I mean, you know, this is, you know, we have different plant personalities, Matthew and I a little bit, right? Like you, okay. You set up your plants, right? Matthew to have them water, like watered less frequently because you know, that's how you do it. For me, I have a really strict schedule where I'm like, okay, I know Monday and Thursday are my watering days and then I can kind of like get it all done and know that I'm on top of it. If I water mine once a week, I keep it under the grow lights. I... Have, I have a pretty consistent um, fertilizer routine, too, where like I'll just mix in fertilizer in the water. Under those conditions, it's just stayed flowering. Like, f leaves will die back. I'll get another shoot, not flowering, sorry, with, with foliage. Yeah, so I think you can get there. Yeah, Stephen has created, like, 
permanent summer for his plans. Exactly. Unending summer. And I think just to say, like, you know, we've been saying, okay, there's some pitfalls, like, in the rest of this episode, right? But you can get there, and, um, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, what I wanted to say about growing the Stefania the very, very first time when it was in that tiny pot, I – actually, sad story. It was the most gorgeous, like – antique Japanese bonsai dish. It had the most beautiful, like malachite green glaze. I spent way too much money, but I love that pot. It fell and it broke and I was devastated. I was angry at you too. Yeah, Stephen was hoping that I would put that pot in my will so that like when I die, Stephen gets it. (laughs) Oh my God, I love that. It was literally the most beautiful like piece of ceramic I've ever owned. But regardless, with this Stefania being like now in a pile of pot shards and dirt on the ground of my apartment, I was surprised to find that it had two roots. It had grown vine and a couple of small pitiful leaves. It had two tiny roots coming out of it that had branched a bunch. So if you're trying to get your plant growing, like if you can keep that soil lightly, evenly moist, that's going to really help you grow a lot more roots out because some of these cutisiform plants that come from like a potato that you can ship like, you know, a dormant little knob, they'll grow roots in different ways. Some cyclamen grow roots just from the top. Some grow it just from the bottom. Some grow from all around. So if you really want to get into some of these plants and get them growing really well, see if you can find a little bit of information about where the roots grow out of the specific one that you're growing, because that can vary a little bit and it might just change how you pot them up, how you get them going. And it'll probably benefit the plant in its first growing season. Once it wakes up for you, if it has that really good chance to establish a root system immediately. Oh, plant friends. I'm so excited to introduce you to one of our newest sponsors, wind river. The magical feeling of hearing the deep, moving resonance of a Wind River chime in your garden, plant friend, is nothing short of magical. Not to use that word twice, but there's no other way to describe it. I can't begin to effectively put into words the peace and serenity that these Wind River chimes that I've had in my household have brought me and Billy. If you are looking for a new way to grow joy in your life and find a moment of peace, I cannot recommend a Wind River chime enough for your home and or your garden. So Wind River is a Virginia-based company that has lovingly been creating premium handcrafted crafted and hand-tuned wind chimes for over 35 years. They were kind enough to send me and Billy some of their American-made high-quality chimes, and on New Year's Day, Billy and I had the most special experience. We had a campfire, we reflected on 2022, we looked towards 2023, and we hung our chimes. Sitting beneath the magic mix of wind and music inspired by the wind was the most incredible feeling. It makes you feel more connected to nature because you're like hearing the wind, something that you can't see. And the sound that they make is so much richer than any other set of chimes that I've heard. And I've been thinking about how I could tell you about the magic of these chimes. And then I realized, wait a minute, I could tell you about them or this podcast is audio format. I can literally play the chimes for you. So please enjoy this mindful moment. Brought to you by our newest partner, Wind River. Let's take a deep breath. Hold it. And exhale. Hold it. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Exhale. And hold it. That's a snippet of the bells that Billy and I were actually listening to. I think there should be a chime in every garden, in every household plant, friends. So get yourself or your loved one. These would make an amazing gift. When you use the code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com, you'll get a free engraving to add a special element to your gift. So... You can engrave the chimes, especially if you're gifting them to someone. This is a great coupon to take advantage of. The chimes come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds. You can listen to all the different sounds on their website. So head to windriverchimes.com and use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to make sure that you get a free engraving on all Corinthian bells. 
special thanks to Espoma Organics. Espoma Organic is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor-outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. Plant friends, if you're prepping your garden season, they've got everything you need from high-quality seed starting mix to all the potting mixes you could ever dream of for your containers or garden beds, garden soil, garden compost for when you get your plants and seedlings into the ground, and a wide array of fertilizers and plant food that are all organic. And if it's your house plants that you're taking care of this winter, they've got everything you need for your house plant potting needs as well. From their plant-specific mixes for cacti, African violets, orchids, or even bonsai mix, I use their general potting mix, and sometimes if it's a plant that needs a real aerated mix, I'll add the orchid mix into their general potting mix to create kind of an aeroid mix. And I also love their liquid houseplant fertilizer. It makes fertilizing your houseplant stupidly easy. Plus, their manufacturing facilities are 100% solar-powered and They have bio-preferred packaging. To learn more about their organic indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Espoma Amazon storefront for a list of my favorite products that they make that I use on my indoor and outdoor plants. Also, about your pot, did it shatter? Shatter. Or did it just break into one or, oh. It shattered completely. (laughs) Okay. I um I recently broke a pot that was very meaningful to me uh-huh. and I actually ordered online uh Did you get that Japanese repair kit? Yeah. Yeah, the repair kit with the gold and um that's uh on my to-do list for my my holiday break off to just spend some time learning how to do that. I have this alabaster pot or something. I did the same thing to it. Very curious to hear how it turns out, Maria. I think it's so fascinating that you're right. If you eliminate the changing of seasons, you don't need to have your plant go dormant. But if it does go dormant, what do we need to know about these plants when it's time for them to kind of take a beat? Take a beat, go to sleep. You walk in, there's a potato in your pot. Now yeah, what? like sometimes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What, is, what do you do? Some of these plants, it's an obligatory mechanism. Uh, others, it's not a mechanism that they observe at all. And for some, apparently it's kind of like up to the plant's whims and fancies or the growing conditions that you've subjected them to. For me, my Stefania, even giving it consistent water, growing on a windowsill where it got natural daylight levels and lengths, that triggered dormancy for it from what I can tell. It's not like I changed my watering. The leaves just, you know, yellowed and fell off eventually. But that's honestly one of the things that makes codex plants to me a little bit more of a collector's plant, and it it adds to that sort of like additional challenge or like higher maintenance plant kind of, you know, quality that we're assigning to them because you have a part-time plant. You have a plant that is sometimes in beautiful foliage, and then other times of the year, it is a potato, or it's just like this naked lump It is in a rugged pond. and architectural, okay? We're gonna it is rugged and architectural. It, yes, yeah. it is rugged and architectural. But like, let's say that, that. You're, you're like me, and you have windowsills, not with drapes or curtains, but instead plants. And so like, if I have a couple of trellises of some really beautiful, like you know, climbing yam plant that's providing me some aesthetics in my home and it's providing some screening from people peering in my windows, that's not going to be there all year round. So you have to kind of like alter your your decor, how you've styled these plants. Some of them want, you know, drier, cooler conditions. Some of these plants really don't need any kind of seasonal change at all, and they might still trigger these dormancy. So this is the period where you don't water them very much. It's super easy. They don't even need light because they're not photosynthesizing. So for some of these plants, you can literally just kind of like take those pots, put them in a cool out of the way spot. You don't want it to be too warm to trigger them into like active growth, even if you're not watering, but give them Give them a little bit of water sometimes for some of them. I killed my Stefani Erecta because I didn't water it at all over its dormancy. And then I started watering it again and I was like, oh, this is a husk. Like, oh, there's no more roots. Yeah. Oh, look, all the roots dried up. There's not yeah. even an interior to this codex anymore. It's <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. And it's that looked like rot. It wasn't. It just didn't get any water. So some of them also, the roots will just die. And that's fine because they'll sprout new ones. That's why you can ship them that way. 
But if you want the Codex to not use up reserves just trying to sustain itself for another seasonal growth, do a little bit of research about how much off-season, off-growing season water it might want. Some of these may want a bit or else they'll be completely depleted and withered before they wake up. For some of these plants, like I'll put adeniums in this group, they might just kind of go deciduous, but they're a little photosynthetic. The stems might be silvery. They might be greenish. You probably still want them to have some light, but when they're not an active growth, you hold off on the water a lot. You hold off on fertilizer. It's not really that tricky. It's mostly about just remembering to give them enough water that they don't suffer before it's time to wake up. And then keep an eye on them because there could be some signal like either light levels or heat levels independent from water access, that could trigger them to grow because these store moisture for the plant to resume growth. If the daylights become longer suddenly and the plant is able to sense that, it might begin to grow new shoots before water is there because that's how they're adapted in the wild. Like if daylight, you know, increases, they know it's monsoon season soon, so they want to get going. Make sure that you're paying attention so that if they begin to wake up, then you can start giving them what else they need in addition to their higher light, their more consistent temperature patterns, all of that. That's that's what I would say for their general care. Love that. Okay. So let's call this section Stefania, but better. That is an homage to Joshua Weissman, if you guys follow him on YouTube, the chef. But um What are other codex plants that might be a better choice for people who are looking for a lower maintenance plant or just like easier success with with plants? I know, Matthew, we should begin with you discussing the ant plant because I know you have a very strong opinion about this plant. So why don't we start there? (laughs) Well, we start there because these are, to get Matthew about it, these are in the coffee family, actually. Like there's I didn't right. know that. See, at classic Seattle guys talking about their coffee plants. Now, and, and the term ant plant is broad. It's not a taxonomic term. It's a term to describe plants that have developed relationships with ants to have like hollow portions or something that ants can inhabit. So there's like... So in the codex, right, there are tunnels. There are places yeah. for these ants to live. And in the wild, it actually happens. For me, this was kind of just I saw like, it. really? No, no. I really? saw it on my honeymoon wow. when I was in Costa Rica. I saw real life ant plants in the jungle. It was so cool. They are really neat. And so it's a it's a relative of the gardenias and the coffees. And they have this like really impressive codex that just grows as an epiphyte. They have kind of like, you know, white brittle roots that cling to their surface in the wild. They get rained on. So they need high amounts of air on their roots, but they also get very consistent moisture. Some of them are good with drought. Some of them prefer more consistent water. So again, you do have to kind of research the individual species that you're growing. So I first learned about ant plants when I was like doing my first vivarium build back in like 2007 or something because they were being listed by vivarium plant sellers as good, like medium to large size planted tropical terrarium plants because, you know, they they grow well as epiphytes, they like humidity, they're evergreen, they maintain their foliage all year. And since that point, there were only a few that were available. There are quite a few different like genera of these codiciform ant plants. Right. Really different looks and shapes and leaf shapes and everything. Yeah, and some of them are fairly hard to distinguish, but you will find at least a few varieties in many plant shops today. There's the Hydnophytum genus, which is a pretty common one. I grow that one. Then there's also Myrmophytum. So there's there's a lot of options that might have narrow leaves. They might have round leaves. The codex may be like a round, like smooth, lumpy kind of shape, like the Hydnophytum, or it might be more spiny with little aerial roots that jut out like thorns, like I've seen on my Myrmophytum. And You just want to grow them in a really coarse, well-draining, but moisture-retaining mix. So I actually use basically the same mix that I use for a lot of my Aeroids, a lot of my Hoyas. It's just chunky with coconut husk chunks and charcoal and perlite and pumice. And it allows 
excellent drainage, but it also allows them to stay fairly consistently moist for long periods of time before I need to water them again. And in the summer, you keep them pretty well wet. They respond well to fertilizer. They always have air moving through the roots, so you can keep them pretty moist. They will rot if you keep them too wet and if there's not enough airflow. Like those two things together become a problem. So if your mix is finer, let them dry more. If your mix is super coarse, keep them wet. And you can grow them mounted, but you basically have to water them every day if you're going to do that. But the really great thing about these is that they grow into amazing specimens pretty quickly. And I've had the two that I'm growing now. They live on a west-facing windowsill that gets really good light. And I'm actually growing them in that kind of like layered planting technique that I've discussed. And it's on our TikTok. That you're known so well. Yeah. Yeah, like it's a glass vase that has a hole drilled in the side of it so that there's like the LECA layer that water flows out of the side hole, like where the water reservoir ends. Then there's a wick to draw the water from that reservoir into the chunky aeroid mix that it's in. But I fertilize them a few times a summer and they grow surprisingly fast. Like it might not look like it's growing super fast, but if you look and compare it to older photos, you'd be like, dang, that codex is three times bigger than it was when I planted it two years ago. And they also have cool flowers. They are not very showy because they show right between like leaf axles along the stem. But my Myrmophytum has true blue flowers. Like they are actually pale sky blue. They're stunning. The Hydnophytum, they're just tiny and white. There's no fragrance, unfortunately, like I always expect from gardenia slash coffee family plants. But the cool thing is that they basically self-fertilize themselves. So you often get berries that form on your mature plants. And these berries might be white, they might be red or yellow, and you could just pluck them out and then like plant them and you can grow your own new ant plant. But the reason that I love these so much is because they're very like kind of tropical foliage appealing. They're also bizarre botanical novelty plants that people will just be intrigued by. They are kind of designed in this like evolutionary sense to work with certain species of ants that are not native to where we are. So you're not going to have ants moving in if they're growing in your kitchen, even if you move them outside for the summer. You're not going to get ants. I do keep telling Brian like, oh, yeah, I have an order from Papua New Guinea to get like, you know, uh, a queen ant from this species that it can live in our kitchen. And he's like, you're not doing that. Oh my Don't worry, gosh. That won't happen. But it can happen <laughs> if you're in like a greenhouse because sometimes things come in from where they were grown. So I have heard that as an issue, but as a home person, don't worry about it. You're not going to get ants in your apartment or grow room. Yeah, I just think ant plants are great. There's a lot of them. You can have a collection of them. They do really well if you're just faithful with keeping them lightly moist while they're in active growth. I let them dry a bit over the winter between waterings. And so far, they're not too frustrated. Once they've grown up a bit, they can tolerate more drought. So if you start to notice the codex looking a little bit shriveled, or if leaves are yellowing and dropping, give it some water. If it's not growing well, or if the leaves are yellowing and you're watering it nicely, give it some fertilizer. They're surprisingly easy. I've killed a bunch of them. But after kind of like doing this like layered planting method or being more consistent with my water in general, they're surprisingly great. Yeah. And then Stephen mentioned the Discoria and the Bigfoot plant earlier, but that's a huge group that like it's more like the Stefania. But these are plants that just grow vines out of like this seasonal husk. Some of them become enormous. Yeah, like barky codex. Yeah. They're cool. And like, I just want to kind of throw in, like, I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about people calling sweet potatoes yams, but these are two great families for codex plants because you have like the morning glory family is convolvaceae like i said before that's where we get like sweet potatoes but there's also a lot of like quote morning glories that do grow from a very stefania like tuber and they'll grow beautiful vines of beautiful foliage beautiful flowers they're a little bit harder to find but you can get them online you can get them through specialty places they're stunning. And we all know what morning glory flowers, this whole family has those like trumpet shaped blooms. I think they're fantastic. And then the yam family 
<laughs> I hope that I'm saying this right. It's Discoriaceae. And they're fairly similar because there are, you know, vines that come out of these plants. And there are just some really amazing plants in both of these groups. That is where I would put people towards, like, if you want a seasonal vine that just has, like, gorgeous foliage that grows rapidly, some of these flower, some of them have cinnamon-scented flowers, like... The Yam family, the Morning Glory family, take a look there. There There's so many choices. There's a lot of very similar plants elsewhere that kind of do this similar thing, but they're very seasonal. So you gave us kind of some high-level places to look, but if you want to grow these types of plants, codex plants, it does require a little bit more research, a little bit more understanding of the species. So take this kind of high-level Stefania, but better as we'll have all the names in the show notes, but then take these names and go do your own research, see which ones you're drawn to and explore because it really is a wide and wild world of codex. And you can really just Google, like if you're on, like I love Etsy and eBay for ordering some of my weird plants. You can just like search for codex plants and you can find new ones that you haven't heard of. There are species geraniums that do this. There's a ficus. Well, there are several ficus, but like there are codex plants for a lot of different tastes and styles. There are some that are very tropicals oriented. There are some that are very succulents oriented. There are some that are like weird, ugly, botanical novelty oriented. Like there's just a ton of choices here. Yeah, I love it. So go indulge your curiosities, ask Google, and I can't let you guys go without getting your updates. Our audience who knows you probably wants to know what's been going on. I personally know you and know, number one, that you're, you know, growing into different types of plant parents, exploring new curiosities that you have. Also, I want to pat you guys on the back for exploring your plant passions offline, privately, and letting that like really fuel you and light you up. So can I have your updates on, you know, last year we kind of talked about this, what we were looking forward to doing in 2022. So what are you guys looking forward to in 2023 in regards to your plant collections? So for me, I am dusting off. Uh, I had an old online presence called Weird House Plants. It was an Instagram and YouTube thing. It's a different style than what we were doing at Plant Daddy. It's a lot more sort of just talking about care and showing them something that I think is strange. And, you know, it probably isn't at this point, right? Or maybe it never was, right? But like ones that I think are cool and special. At home, I'm focusing more on my little cacti and succulents and kind of my stuff like on a table, like Pokemon size, collectible, you know, odd things like that. Yeah, excited about that. And if I can share it here, my next little moonshot thing that I'm doing with a friend, we're writing a Christmas movie. Okay. (laughs) Is that so out of left field? Right. So I have a friend who's a screenwriter. And we wrote this thing kind of for fun. And his manager was like, oh, my gosh, no, this is actually like what people sort of want right now. So all of my December, and this is being recorded in December, we're meeting a few times a week trying to do this first draft of this movie. And we're both like, what are we doing? This is such a kind of funny, weird genre. I'm watching tons of Christmas movies. And it's just like a fun thing to try. Did you watch the new Lindsay Lohan movie? Of course. (laughs) I loved it. So many people yeah, I love this genre. And for me, I'm kind of like, sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're funny. Right. But they're definitely comforting. Also, Will Ferrell's new Christmas movie that came out on Apple, Spirited. Incredible. Incredible. Can I sing the holiday music on your movie? <laughs> yes. I'm going to say yes. Okay. I don't, I don't know how it works yet, but yeah. Put me, if you need, I'll do it for free. Put me in coach. Yes. If you need, if you need it in, you know, any sort of pitch packaging, I'm happy to provide vocals for you. Holiday music is my favorite to sing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Oh my God. That makes me so excited. You didn't, I didn't know that offline. That makes me, you are, like I say, Stephen, you are an onion, my friend. You are just the juiciest onion. Okay. What about you, Matthew? Uh, well, I have, Since we started our hiatus, I dove into home renovations and landscaping. Like, I replaced a bunch of light fixtures. I, like, redid the whole entryway to our house with, like, stripping and refinishing the front door and making my own, like, bespoke 
address plaque and repainting railings. And I've, you know, like we've lived in this house for over two years now. We've owned it for one of those years. I knew what I wanted to do in the garden. I was planning out in my head all of the little details for more than a year before I even started doing anything. So as soon as Stephen and I were like wrapped up with season three, I was out in the yard digging up everything. There was nothing that I could salvage. So I started by just removing every single awful dead shrub and diseased thing from the yard. Then we had our brickwork restored because it's a 1929 craftsman tutor. And I now know a lot about masonry and like vintage homes. And I'm researching like how to restore like, you know, a previously remodeled 1929 Tudor style craftsman. So I'm like, you know, downloading 20s catalogs of tiles. Yeah. But, you know, I've. Your knowledge of stone, like the, the, the diatribe you went off on about stone the other day when we were talking, I was like, damn, this guy does research, whether it's plants or what, like you are passionate about learning on another level. I just have this, this vision in my head. And in our neighborhood, there's a lot of people who do kind of like raised garden bed rockeries, but they're all using basalt, which is a common rock around here for landscaping. But I wanted something a little different because I'm just that kind of person. So I went with like North Cascade granite because like, I love the idea that it's kind of local and I hike in the North Cascades. And then I used flagstone. I like, I I laid a big patio in the center of the lawn. I did rockeries for raised plants. My vision is that it's all seasons appeal, that there's something blooming every day of the year. Every flower that was like specifically selected for the flowers, they're all either white or black. And I know that I have to kind of like be a little bit flexible in what I mean by black, but I've gotten really close with some of these things and everything is fragrant. And I've researched like sagebrush. So I have like tons of different kinds of artemisia and I have like all these mini collections. Like here are all of the Daphnes. Here are all of the cyclamen. Here's all the yuccas. So what I'm hearing garden party when Maria visits Seattle. Oh yeah. Matthews. And hell yeah. I even made my own fire pit. Yeah. Like the fire pit. It is a smokeless design. I learned how to do concrete. I learned how to make forms. I got a special concrete that's used for like crematoriums and pizza ovens. So anyway, that's that's been my whole life. And now that we finally started getting like cold, wet winter weather in Seattle and we've actually had some snow, like my outdoor plans, they're accomplished. They're done. I get to dive back into the spring after things have woken up a bit. Oh, but, you're going to have so much yeah, fun. I, I have to admit, it's been really nice, like doing things privately for myself creatively that I haven't turned into content. It has been like. This is just something that I'm doing for myself, and I am just so invested, and I'm so passionate about it. It's, like, really reawakened some of my original plant love, and it's been so nostalgic as I'm picking some of these plants that remind me of my grandmother or travels that I've been on. Oh, I just feel so, like, activated and, like, fresh now because I've been looking forward to this project, and I just love making my house a home. So that's just all my energy is going there these days. That's beautiful. You can see it in the way that you talk about it. Like you just lit up like a grow light, like a full spectrum grow light talking about it. And I think that's really important. And I think that's also a huge message for the listeners as we all have our little plantstagrams and we all have, you know, me personally too, just like sharing so much, but it's really beautiful to just like cultivate some passion on the side that's private and sacred almost in that way. So it's, you are inspiring me to kind of refresh that within myself too. I just love you guys so much. This was so fun. Thank you. Oh, it's always a blast to join you. <laughs> Super fun. Yes. Until next time we have our standing January date, if not earlier. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I love it. Love you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Love you. All right. Special thanks to Stephen and Matthew. I certainly hope that we might see more of them in the coming months. They're just the greatest, and I'm so thankful for their friendship. You know, the podcasting space has gotten much larger since I've joined, and I've just, I love their podcast and I love these boys. They're so nice. I really hope to go to Seattle and visit them one day. I seriously need to see all of the amazing work that Matthew's done in his outdoor garden. Pictures aren't enough. And also special thanks to our sponsors. We have a bunch of new sponsors this year in 
order to help support the show and and help me create weekly episodes instead of bi-weekly episodes. Our sponsors are handpicked by me. I approach a lot of them because they make products that I like and, and want and want our community to have. We have such an amazing group of companies supporting the show and I can't speak highly enough, especially of the four sponsors in this in this episode. Wind River Chimes, The Most Magical Chimes, The Barabee Weighted Blanket, Territorial Seed Company. Oh my God, I love all their seeds. And um, obviously Espoma Organic, My Rider Dies. So thanks again for them supporting. And let me know if you try a Codex plant after this episode. I'm excited, like I said, for my Stefania Erecta to wake back up. I mean, we're deep in in the winter, so it's going to be a while, but I'm excited for it to awaken and, and try again and maybe trellis it and also explore some of the other varieties that they talked about because they really opened my eyes to so many plants that I hadn't really thought about using as, as houseplants. So with that, my plant friends, it's been a joy to put this episode together for you. And until next time, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will 
will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and plant projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 